If there's a speaker that isn't as loud as me, then you might want to move in a little bit closer. But I'd like to, uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, our, our next two speakers. I'm actually going to talk for 10 minutes too, but um, Dr. Byron Irvine uh, ended up driving from Brandon, Manitoba. So that's a pretty long trek that I'm not even sure I'd do if he invited me. So I'm pretty, uh, pretty happy that he, that he came that distance. Um, he's with Ag Canada. Uh, Dr. Actually, I could say Dr. Brian Barris now too is, uh, I can, can't I? Yeah, he just finished his PhD. He's still got to defend his thesis. So, uh, you know, next time if I don't say doctor, then his thesis defense didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> so Brian, Brian's been around in uh, Lethbridge for quite some time now and heading up the serial agronomy program. I actually used to work for him uh, five years back. So winter wheat's come a long way, and uh, we're we're lucky enough to be partnering with uh, with Ag Canada on a on a really cool new initiative. Uh, that's actually focused on agronomy. So uh, lots, of, lots of different plots where they were trying to address some of those issues that are holding back winter wheat. Like it's sort of been slowly gaining popularity. I think we hit a million acres here this year, which is great. But um, even myself having worked on it for 10 years now, winter crops in general just have such a huge advantage. And uh, if we can get to a point where we're seeding, you know, 20, 30, 40% of our acres as winter crops, on the, the years that we've had, the springs that we've had the last couple of years wouldn't be so darn bad. So uh, definitely a lot of interest. We have a big program on the winter peas and lentils that, that we're still working on and, and still excited about. Even the, the potential of tagging up a winter pulse with a, with a winter wheat would be another benefit. So that's actually what this trial is about. There's no winter wheat in this trial, but we're setting ourselves up to grow winter wheat because it's all about crop sequences. So we've got four crops here. Uh, camelina, canola, barley, fall camelina, which is now summer fallow, you can see. Didn't work out too well. And uh, what did I miss there? And peas, field peas. So the idea is, is we're looking at crop sequences. So what's, uh, what's the best uh, crop that we can grow before coming into winter wheat? A lot of the issues that growers have is, you know, can we get an early enough crop so that we actually have time to get our winter wheat in. We've been having a lot of struggles just getting crops off so we can get back in there. So, so maybe now that we've developed better winter tolerance in the winter wheats, we could follow up into a pea stubble that before we were worried about having enough stubble to you know, effectively protect that plant throughout the winter and snow trap and protect it from wind and such. So what we've done with this trial is we've added on a little bit of something and it's, it's it's in line with what we did last year if you were here at the field school along the energy side of things. So we looked at this as, hey, we've got four different crops going in at the same time with four different seeding depths. It would be a really good opportunity to study sort of the ecological footprint or the carbon footprint that crops do have. Because we've got a lot of good studies out there um, and a lot of people that are interested in the energy and sustainable impacts of crop production, but we don't have a lot of concrete research data that shows, you know, can we say, hey, you know, I'm growing peas now, am, am I a more sustainable farmer than uh, my neighbor? And really what it comes down to is if we're going to break it down, we can calculate the energy of all of our inputs, everything from, you know, when we think energy, we always get fixated on diesel fuel. So, so yeah, we're going to measure our diesel fuel, zero tillage versus conventional. And if you did a chance, you can run by our tractor there. We've actually put a jerry can on it, basically, an auxiliary, auxiliary fuel tank. And we measured the fuel that it took to seed all of these crops. And it's replicated four times. We also have a load cell on there. So we could measure the power requirements that it took. So that's something you can't really do on a big farm because you've you got to do one crop at a time, one field at a time. So we've got the opportunity to compare all of these crops, same soil conditions, same soil type, same time. So everything's seeded within one day. So we got to look at the horsepower requirements for all those different seeding depths. The other thing that we're doing is evaluating the potential of inter-row seeding. So our tractor here is set up with auto steer guidance. Uh, we don't have a cab, so we have to be careful when it rains, but it's a pretty neat thing. So last year, the stubble that we went into is a barley stubble. It was all seeded with auto steer guidance. 
and then we came, we're going to come back in here uh, with the winter wheat and have treatments where we're seeding in between the row versus on the row. So a lot of different things that we're going on with. Uh, back to the whole energy, and then what we can do afterwards is we keep track of the fertilizer rates. We keep track of, uh, you know, basically all of our inputs. And at the end of the day, we can calculate the amount of energy that it took to produce the amount of crop for each one of these crops. So it's very simple. It's basically we break it down to a basic unit of energy, which is a joule in metric. If you're not a metric guy, that's a calorie. Just like the food you eat, we can calculate how many calories it took to create this much amount of crop. And from last year, uh, it, with help from Dr. Alwyn Smith with the Research Center, we could calculate that. And what's really neat, especially when it comes to the pulses, the pulses to produce a crop of pulses, and this is the actual data that we use from our own on plots, was 1,100 megajoules per acre. So when we switch to canola, we look at it and it's 2,600 megajoules per acre. Any idea why there'd be that big of a difference between growing a canola crop and a pea crop? I heard nitrogen. Yeah. Why, why nitrogen? Why would that make a difference? Yeah, that's more like it. Actually, both crops probably use the same amount of nitrogen. Canola is probably a little bit more, especially if you're irrigating, but the difference is that pulses fix the nitrogen themselves. So it, it grabs it from the air. It's got the bacteria and the nodules that just, it makes its own nitrogen. So they both use the same amount of nitrogen. In one case where the canola has to use nitrogen fertilizer, it's a very, very energy intensive pro, um, process. So to be able to have something that does that for you, all of a sudden, you know what? Plain and simple, if you guys have pulses in your crop rotations, we've got a good news story when it comes to the energy required to produce a crop. You can go to your neighbor in Vancouver and say, yeah, I've got pulses, I'm saving this much energy. So we're trying to build some good news stories on the things that we're doing here, you know, in Southern Alberta, in Alberta, so that, you know, there's always a bad rap when it comes to agriculture. We're not doing things great. So we've got the zero tillage story. Now we've got numbers that show how much fuel saving we've got in zero tillage. We've got great numbers by including pulses into our thing. So with our growing stewardship program, we're gonna go out there and try to sell some of that basically. And that will have good reper uh, repercussions as far as bringing industries into Alberta, into Canada, and for you guys marketing your farms. That's becoming a very interesting thing now is you guys have to market your own farm. Seed growers are doing it now. Everyone's getting into fancy stuff, but when you can start showing people and producers and, and your customers, like this is, this is some of the good news stories that we have, they're more likely to deal with you as a customer. So the whole idea of branding your farm, uh, building a reputation, this stuff does play a role, even though you know, at the end of the day, you're really interested in making money. I mean, who isn't? This is, this, this is gonna help you guys build money. Um, we're just going to move down here to look at our next poster here. So how many of you guys have heard of the concept of inter-row seeding? It's been a pretty popular subject right now. Who could give me a definition of inter-row seeding? No, I want to know, define it. What do I mean by inter-row seeding? Okay, everybody hear that? Seeding between last year's stubble? Can you give me some more specifics? Okay, no, I, I'm, still, I'm still stuck on this definition because I think we need to think about it as a concept. Does it mean it has to be exactly between last year's stubble? No. Where, where, can it be anywhere? Okay, so we got the same, same kind of answer that we did get last year and that he said uh, inter-row seeding is basically anywhere in between the stubble row as long as we don't uproot the, the last year's stubble row. Does that make sense to you guys? Do you care? Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. 
Or if you got a cover crop and you want to go in each row. Yeah. Like like doing two crops at once. Yeah. yeah. So this is the plot where the fall camelina was seeded. It just uh, didn't survive. Um, we did end up doing a pre-seed burn down. So it's just a good opportunity to look at the stubble from last year still. Can you guys see that it's all, is it all standing? No, there's a few missing. Well, yeah. Tire tracks. yeah, so our, our tractor tires are actually set to be on the outside, but this one roll right here, would that fall? Does that kind of, yeah, that's not good. that talks about what you're saying. That's, that's worst case scenario, right? As long as we don't uproot last year's. Well, I think what happened was, is we actually had the stubble was seeded on 10 inch row spacing and we seeded with the nine inch row seeder. So we were actually able to seed and we didn't try to inter row seed, by the way, this is just natural. We drive up and seed, but we have guidance. So when you've got perfect straight lines, just by probability, you're going to end up somewhere in between last year's stubble, right? And we actually calculated that on all of our winter wheat plots that we seeded. We ended up with an 85% by that definition into row seeding. So this one row, that, went, that ended up going right on top of that row. So definitely an issue. We did plant counts and this picture here sort of, um, I know it's a little small, you guys are all far back, but we, we decided on that same definition as well. Basically anywhere in between the row, we'll call a, a between the row. So we did plant counts and we called it a B. And then anything that was right on top of the row that really made a mess of that stubble, we called it on row. And we evaluated the plant counts. And we counted somewhere around 13,000 plants and ran statistics on that. And we ended up with 127 plants per meter squared on both. So this is winter wheat. You know, it's in the fall, the, the soil is warm. No difference in plant stand establishment kind of a bit of a shock but when we came back this spring and we looked at our winter wheat plots we noticed that every once in a while we saw a row that wasn't growing quite as well as the other row and it all survived I think like the winter wheat still survived just fine because we still have a lot of other stubble that's protecting it but that stuff that was right on top which just wasn't wasn't quite as tall and it wasn't quite as green so we're not exactly sure what the problem is whether it's uh, nutrients being tied up around all of that organic matter or if there's some kind of breakdown exudit that would be an allelopathic effect something that's sort of just slowing it down or not but we did see an effect so now we can say pretty clearly that that worst case scenario we want to avoid so how do we do it how much of an issue is it uh, does it apply to all crops so because we got that same plant stand thing i'm starting to think maybe we got to be focusing more on our small seeded crops, especially the canola. Camelina is a good example. I know it's not a big crop yet, but we uh, included it in this study because you can harvest it really early. So it would be a great opportunity to get in there uh, with winter wheat. Ken? Yes, sir. Maybe I have an explanation why the seed that, that we served last year's trouble didn't, serve, didn't, uh, didn't look as good. Okay, if you set the depth for the hill to the higher mound, yeah and and that's playing into some of my points that I was going to make very quickly and uh, you know a lot of people have a lot of interest in in and theoretically a lot of inter row seeding stuff oh yeah it's going to warm up faster in the middle we could talk about weed competition seeding into taller stubble yada yada i don't want to get tied up into that we do have temperature probes and a study this year just one study so keep in mind uh, it's only one site one year results and we did canola with two openers and we did our our very best at doing our very worst so we did try to seed everything on top of the row using the guidance so we basically we, we parked our, our openers right on last year's stubble and we snapped our GPS line and we went. And then our, our other treatment is we just drive up to the plot and go. Whatever happens, happens. And then the other one is we tried our best to see in between the rows. And that's this graph here. So we did, we, we did have a chance to get plant counts from this year. We had a 10% reduction in stand establishment when we were on top of the seed row. So that is pretty significant. If 
what you were doing was everything on row. So you have to sort of evaluate what's going on in your farm. How much am I seeding on the row? You know, it's going to be different with your row spacing, your opener, how wide your opener is. But nevertheless, this is with two openers, a pillar laser disc and the stealth paired row opener. 10% reduction, you know, that if that was what's happening, that's very significant and worth paying attention to on your farm at nine pounds or nine dollars a pound. And I think what we are seeing is it's it's very much about what you're saying there, Dave. It's all about depth control. It's it's that that stubble is, and we we got some pictures. It actually spread it. It helped spread the seed out. It didn't go as narrow as it normally would. It was having trouble uh, closing the furrow properly. So it would fall in, absolutely. Uh, those are some potential ideas. I don't have the data yet on the difference in soil temperature, but if I had to make a guess, I don't think that's gonna be a big factor. Yes? If you have 60 feet of drill with a stealth opener, yep. it has a tendency of going in between the rows. Yes. And the opposite goes for disc drill. Yeah. Go anywhere. Yeah, I think that's 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 pretty fair. We did a, a section uh, in Celestia's stubble with stealth openers, and about 90% of the stubble is still standing with no guidance to get you in between rows. Yeah, were you using guidance to seed though? Yes. Yeah. So that to me, that's that's a big jump in in. A lot of you guys are doing interrow seeding already. You know that. All, all your you're not knocking down all of your stubble. It's whether you want to take that extra 10%. If you're not going in the same tracks and where your drills lap, if you're not going in the same tracks as last year, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where you have your drill set. It'll, some of it will be in the row and some of it will be on top of the row. Well, I think with, with, with advanced GPS guidance, even if you weren't on the same track, you can, you can get it perfect. You know, and they've got the GPS towers that you could put on the cedar itself that sends a signal to correct for that. So if there's any shift in where the cedar, the implement it is itself that it can correct for it. So you can get from 90% to 100%. That it is possible, yeah. Okay, I, I don't wanna to talk too long because uh, Byron had a long drive, but if you wanna take a quick look, there's a very good example in our Camelina here of the worst case scenario. So can you see I've got a little bit of spray paint on there. Does that one row look a little bit wonky? Yeah. So that's a row that was seated on top of last year's stubble, whereas all of the rest are in between. I think you can actually see that the seed's been spread out a little bit. It's obviously delayed in maturity. So, you know, by using guidance, you can get into that situation. It's just, uh, what do we do to correct it? So. We're, we're probably going to do some more work on, on this because I think there's, there's definitely something to it, but you have to be careful about evaluating it on your own farms and whether it's worth, you know, investing a lot of time into it. So there's certainly a difference. Yeah. How wide is your row space? Nine inch. Nine inch. Okay. Yeah. Both kinds? Sorry? Well, uh, both, the, uh, previous crop. the previous crop was actually 10 inch, oh, okay. so that, but that the study, yeah, plus we weren't trying to interro seed, we were just going, right? So that will happen if you're always seeding in the same direction with perfect straight lines. One yeah. thing, there's more seed goes into a crooked row, you know that? To a crooked row. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Again, yeah. Maybe I don't, I'm not sure about it, but uh, when you They'll go over the over the stubble, eh? Yeah. You, the, you got bacterians in the soil, eh? Yeah. And they break that's down break the down, the, down the stubble. They need nitrogen. Yeah. So maybe that's they got small plants. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, that's immobilization of nutrients. That's what I meant by that. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Organic matter. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna pass things off to Byron now. We've had more than our share of, uh, of water this spring and one of the values that we've had of winter wheat is that although it's a pain to get it <coughs> seeded in the fall, uh, 
the areas at least that haven't actually been inundated with water have some really nice looking crops um, not too far behind what is around here but I think there'll be a lot more winter wheat growing in the ground this winter or this fall because there's going to be a lot of fields that look exactly like that where they're going to be chem fallow because no crop was seeded and there's some places in the province where we're under 10 percent seeded and a lot of it's only 50 percent or less but anyway those are some of the values of having winter wheat but usually those aren't things that really matter in southern Alberta although I guess this spring maybe that was not the case but we're looking at a multi-site set of trials and so on here uh, Dr. Brian Bears has been leading and so on but if I had some previous data here which is presented on pages 11 and 12 of your uh, booklet here and it was kind of the background of which we went to going ahead and working on this type of trial. Uh, that previous work was all funded through Ducks Unlimited and they continue to be the, the uh, industry lead on this one with funding coming from all the different commissions and so on. So some of the money that you're paying to your uh, winter wheat checkoff thing is, is going to support this as well as about two-thirds of the money coming from the federal government plus us but what we're trying to do with here is to explain some of the results that we had from our previous and to work and to move it a little bit forward our previous work which is shown in in this thing here has a couple of really interesting uh, components to it one of them was that uh, we pretty much always for spring cereals and for winter cereals found that canola was our best crop to seed into and that's a pretty good news story since we're almost at 20 million acres of canola should be no problem right well as you all well know a lot of times when you put canola down it takes two three four weeks for the green seed to clear and all of a sudden you're talking the end of September before you can actually go out and that's really not desirable because what that does is it pushes your winter wheat maturity if it survives back and makes it much more comparable to spring wheat maturity and then you don't get it harvested as early and you make your problem worse because you've had to fight to get it in at the same time you've been combining it and now you're combining it at the same time you're combining everything else so not a desirable situation and so we're trying to figure out what other crops worked well. Well, in this trial, which had been conducted at more severe winter locations, Brandon, Malfort, which is northeastern Saskatchewan, Lacombe, and at Indian Head, Saskatchewan, just the other side of Regina, we were finding that most of the time, dry pea worked quite well, except that a lot of times you would cut very close to the ground and it would on about uh, Two of our 12 site years, we lost the stands because of cold weather. So maybe in this part of the world, that's not as big a deal, but for a lot of places, it is a pretty big deal. So in the absence of winter kill, P is equal to canola in our previous work. And so that's why both of these are in this trial. What we did with the P on this one is we've got two treatments of P here and one of them we're trying to use the inter-row seeding to essentially if we're able to cut high enough leave the previous falls double standing so make it look like chem fallow only with the pea crop and for us where we get more microsporella we quite often can use a sun pickup or something like that and pull the pea vines right off the ground because they kind of get chopped off at the soil surface and then you would still have this standing stubble and if you can see between the rows of it you have a enough snow to make it through there. The second kind of interesting piece of data that comes out of this was that we found that barley cut for silage actually had about a 10 percent higher yield than if we would cut that barley for grain. So there's three different uh, possible explanations that we've come up with so far. One is that was what was mentioned before, the whole area of denitrification or immobilization, depending on whether or not you're putting it 
on the surface or whatever, but mostly immobilization because in the time we ran this previous trial, the recommendation was to put ammonium nitrate on the surface. Now I think we're kind of going to more at seeding with our nitrogen with some either just straight urea or some of these uh, novel products like ESN or super urea or whatever, and we've got some trials on that as well. But the goal is to get the crop to grow and grow rapidly in the fall and then continue to be able to develop to the right stage so it can take off and compete with the weeds and so on in the spring. But the barley cut for grain has two different things happening that can kind of interfere with that. One is it has the surface residue and then it has the seeds. So this trial here has barley. There's two treatments where we've actually removed the barley at grain. We'll, we'll be removing the barley at the time of grain. And we'll keep all of the straw, cut it normal, eight inches high, and remove all of the residue from two of these treatments. The third one, the residue and the grain go back on. And one of the ones where the residue is removed, we're putting back just the seed. Not something you want to do on a 50-acre field, but you know what we're trying to do is to separate out what's really driving this thing. Is it competition from the barley grain? Is it the residue tying up nitrogen, or causing this, or the residue actually slowing down the growth? My, if I'm betting, I'm betting on the residue slowing down the growth as our major driver because we actually saw this here with both oat stubble cut for grain and also wheat. Our worst case scenario was very predictable. It was winter wheat grown on wheat, more disease, the lowest overall yield. If somebody figures that we can do a stacked rotation, and that's been thought of at times, at least with winter wheat and with spring wheat, in our particular results, didn't work terribly well. In fact, it was the poorest of all. But we, what we found interesting was that the winter wheat and the spring's wheat on stubble of oat and barley, which don't carry a lot of the same diseases, still were poor. And so we're just moving into this scenario, and we tried the camelina here because of what Canada said, it's early and it gets off, and at the time when we were designing these things, it looked like it actually might be a crop that we might be able to grow and make some money on, and who knows, maybe five or six cycles later it will become a, a viable crop. I mean, we've had numerous shots at soybean, at least in Manitoba. Now this year it's almost 700,000 acres, and it was only five years ago that it was almost a, a non-crop. That, that's a really different scenario. That's producing a crop that has already got a big market. Something like this, we have to develop a market for. The thought was it was going to go into jet fuel. Um, don't think that's happening right now with the economic downturn out there. Some of those things have been put on, the whole, on hold. So when we're looking at all of these things, we're just trying to build a story here and add to the previous story. But if you go over to the next page here, it just shows out what I've been telling you in a little more visual form and just want to explain how this graphic system works. So if you look at the very bottom of the page on the left hand side of the page is hard red spring and then on the right hand side is a variety called osprey of, of winter wheat and if you look at the graph it'll have a item on it will say group one, group two, group three, group four as you go clockwise and then on the bottom is the variability and on the y-axis going up is actually the yield. So what we've done is just plotted over all the sites which ones are the best. So group one which has the highest yield and the lowest variability is the best if you're looking at that and I think that's an important factor because sometimes the mean says this and I know uh, a couple of years ago, you could go to the South Saskatchewan River where I used to live in Outlook and you could say that the average depth of the Saskatchewan River down from the street, from the dam was about three and a half feet deep. 
but you could quite easily drown in it because there were a few spots that were 12 feet deep. But the reality of it is it's kind of like this with farming, as you well know, is that there's a risk management component and an average sometimes hides some of that. But anyway, this is fairly consistent with all of the different crops if you look down. But it's more so in the winter wheat and in the wheats than it is, say, in the barley. But group one, both of these things show canola as the major one here. But if you look at group two, which is a little higher variability, but still fairly good yield, you see the barley silage and the pea for the winter wheat. Same sort of thing for the hard red spring wheat. So the tendencies are the same, but the worst case scenario in all these scenarios is, as I said before, wheat on wheat. It's in that group four. It's over on the left, has the lowest yield. It does have lower variability, but it's not that much lower than the other ones. So in, if you're looking at a situation where you want to make things uh, function for you, still this barley silage looks like not a bad move. The real question, is it the silage itself or is it the residue that's on the surface? And that's hopefully what we can answer from some of this work. And there's a lot of other components to this and Brian is uh, you know, dealing with them and there was quite a few other trials on this site. But that's the key component and the take home message from this particular set of trials. And uh, this is one of the few sites, there's only about three sites that these survived our uh, rather weird spring but there's uh, one of the advantages of these multi-site uh, things is we get a lot of variability from year to year and then we can sometimes use a site like Lethbridge to apply some stuff to us here in Manitoba and from Manitoba out here some years when you get a wet spring and a wet summer. So, you know, you may think it's kind of irrelevant sometimes what happens to us and vice versa, but I think a lot of the transfer of information is more based on principles, not absolute means. And so that's what we're trying to get at. Yes, sir? In your winter wheat and wheat diet, did you use a fungicide? On these trials, we evaluated for disease levels, and in none of the cases did we see that the residue, that the levels were high enough to warrant it. But no, we did not. Okay, we got winter wheat to share side by side with canola stubble and barley stubble. The canola stubble now, I don't want to be the judge and subdue them as far as rust, stripe rust, lead rust. The canola stubble head was way worse with rust than the barley stubble rust in the winter wheat side by side. The same properties to it. I don't know if that's just a coincidence, but that's what we found. In fact, so we've seen this two years ago with less disease of barley stubble than our wheat. Especially with rust. With, with stripe rust. Yeah. I really am not a real good person because, of course, in our part of the world, we don't get stripe rust, but we're going to be talking with now, a fellow. Question, uh, we're, we're going to talk about stripe rust. That's what I <laughs> but we would get, you know, leaf rust uh, and in our area and, and uh, the other leaf spotting diseases, and we didn't observe that. But I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I just don't know. <laughs> We ran a, a couple of trials, uh, Guy and I both ran some trials on that, and uh, we had some pretty dry years. 2003 was one of those years and so on. We were seeding into it. Admittedly, we were seeding on fairly heavy land. So on those clay soils, we, did, we were not able to detect differences. We were using both uh, Odyssey and Pursuit in the trial, even at a 2x rate. But I have heard other people suggest that, it, in fact, they've seen damage and so on. But we ran this for a couple of years and we weren't able to detect it, either in stand or in yield. Okay, well, in the interest of time, we'll get started. So if you like, come on over um, and uh, get in a little closer. We're going to be talking about this trial uh, specifically, but um, we'll also entertain and, and discuss uh, uh, some other trials as well. <clears throat> um, Byron and Ken alluded to this this large uh, uh, agronomy initiative that we started, and and the higher goal of that was 
particularly when you talk about enticing new growers or, or first time growers that have, that have grown winter wheat and perhaps unsuccessfully, um, or as a reason not to grow winter wheat, it, it quite often comes around to the difficulty in uh, crop stand establishment in the fall. So a lot of the experiments um, which the, uh, the crop residue experiments contribute to is, you know, how do we enhance crop stand establishment in the fall? Um, so before I talk about this study, um, <clears throat> one of the probably big issues that emerge from each of the three prairie provinces, both from industry stakeholders and the producer associations was, you know, there's a lot of talk now about the effect of seed treatments on cereals. You know, is that something I should be considering? Um, would it pay uh, to incorporate that extra input cost? And so, um, and then the question from winter wheat, well, would it, would it enhance crop stand or plant growth and vigor in the fall to the degree where versus an untreated uh, uh, stand, uh, would there be a benefit there? And so um, we ran it, we initiated a study on seed treatments um, and we're sitting at about nine, seven to nine locations across all three prairie provinces. And, and basically the question there is, do, uh, do seed treatments have an effect over a control with no seed treatment at all? And the seed treatments we're using are a little bit different than what might be commercially available because if we do see a response, we need to follow that up and try and elucidate, you know, what was the, what was the uh, mechanism behind that. So um, we've broken down uh, the components of say a dual uh, fungicide that has both insecticides and fungicides in it. So um, for example, we have an experiment where we have three actual treatments, uh, one with a, just an insecticide component uh, one with a, with a fungicide component that would only control pythium related type uh, uh, pathogens and then a third uh, uh, treatment uh, fungicide that would only um, control uh, septoria uh, tan spot related type um, uh, funguses. And so, and then of course one treatment that has all three as a combined dual that you would uh, normally use if, if you were so inclined to use a seed treatment. Um, <clears throat> those were planted last fall. So the first observations to date, and, I, and, and I'll be honest, I was a little bit skeptical as to what sort of response we would see. Um, quite often we don't see a response for seed treatments uh, down here, but um, definitely in terms of plant growth and vigor to date, particularly uh, first in the spring, um, those particular treatments that had a treatment versus a control uh, definitely were showing enhanced crop growth and vigor. And the other thing we had done on this is incorporated uh, multiple factors. So those same experiments had um, two seeding rates, for example, a low seeding rate of around 200 seeds per meter squared or 20 seeds per square foot, or double that to 400, which in my mind is still a little bit low I typically recommend in the range of 450 uh, for winter wheat. And in fact, we've seen some pretty nice results with spring wheat at that high of a level. So we had that. And then the other thing was seed size and vigor as a factor. So we took a seed lot of CDC butail and just scalped it and took heavy seed, thin seed, and then the regular seed lot itself and had all those treated with various uh, seed treatments as well. So the, so the big, the, the big result to date is um, overall we're seeing a response to seed treatments this year at our locations here in southern Alberta. Byron didn't think he was seeing much over in Brandon. We'll be having a look at Lacombe uh, a little bit later on on the 14th to have a look there and if you're interested the winter wheat tour here is on the 22nd. We'll be going by those plots. The other story to that though is the agronomic system. If you have a weak agronomic system, such as the factor we imposed that had a lower seeding rate with a thin seed, so in other words, a seed lot that might be uh, low in terms of vigor, those particularly would respond to a seed treatment versus the control. The results tend to get masked or diminished when you compare the treatments in say a ideal agronomic system where you've increased your seeding rate and you have 
either you know the regular seed lot of a medium sized seed or the heavier sized seed uh, which would which would theoretically give you more vigor at the outset so in a weaker type system definitely uh, the seed treatment seem to be showing effect at least this year in southern Alberta so that's that's sort of that that those series of experiments in a nutshell the other issue uh, for the Alberta winter wheat producers commission was they wanted to see more work done on downy and Japanese brome in southern Alberta one thing that sort of re-emerged um, is the issue of brome because it also is a grass it also is has that winter annual growth habit and so Basically, the distribution, if you drew a line from here down to the border and then to the southeast, um, you have the, uh, the uh, distribution area for downy brome, which is uh, this one here, which is more of a feathery looking grass, longer awns, a little bit shorter, likes the, uh, the drier conditions. But if you went southwest from here, uh, you're getting into the distribution area of Japanese brome, which is a little bit more of a concern uh, for producers in terms of herbicide options and control. It's a little bit taller and as you can see a little bit larger heads but much shorter awns. And you can have a look at these uh, whenever you want. Um, so to address that concern what we did is we, we took a look at three herbicides Everest, Velocity A and Simplicity. And the question there was would it because they, they have some bit of a residual effect obviously the group twos would there be any benefit to doing the herbicide application in the fall versus the spring? And so the two main proxies for that in terms of ranking the performance would be the phytotoxicity effects of applying the herbicide to winter wheat. Um, uh, so, so the safety part of it and then obviously the efficacy side of it. How well did it control Japanese or downy brome? We, we selected CDC Falcon because I've run studies in the past and, and the general principle is when you select a shorter variety in the presence of pretty heavy weed pressure uh, you create pretty much a weak competitive system particularly if you're at a lower seeding rate so we we selected 300 seeds per meter squared as our as our seeding rate here uh, so we've got a weak we've got a weak competitor for a variety and we've got a little bit weaker system in terms of a seeding rate and then what we did is we also uh, seeded in at the same time 175 seeds of, of, of downy brome on this trial and Japanese brome on this trial. Um, we had a really good catch with downy brome here. Not such a great catch over here with, uh, um, well that's a nice tall one of, down, of Japanese brome. So um, I'll limit my talk just to the downy brome trial because I don't what we could do is we could say pretty much safely say that the results there would show that the chemistries all work pretty good on Japanese brome but we really didn't get enough Japanese brome pressure we have pretty good pressure here um, so to keep the results relatively short you can inspect the plots and decide for yourself um, basically there were velocity A didn't really do a very good job it doesn't have the kind of residual that a, that uh, uh, simplicity or Everest would have so as far as uh, um, efficacy goes, it was simplicity and Everest. Um, but as far as um, safety goes, we ran this site here at Scott, Saskatchewan, and just east of here by Kip on uh, Dr. Bill Hammond's farm. Um, basically, there was no issue with phytotoxicity, um, with simplicity, but with the Everest, the fall Everest, there was an issue and we had at this site an unacceptable level of, of, uh, of phytotoxicity levels or injury to the herbicide application. As far as efficiency in terms of timing between the two, uh, the spring applied herbicides did better than the fall applied. So if you're thinking about, you know, maybe I could spread out my workload and, and, and uh, uh, go with a fall application for control. Uh, I'd be a little bit cautious about that and maybe experiment a little bit with either test strips or varying that, um, dividing the field up into a spring and a fall. Because we did see a bit of an advantage um, with, with the spring applied uh, versus fall. And then of course, there was injury noted with Everest in the fall. So I would be inclined for a control to go with spring applied. and, and and probably Horizon, I mean Everest is doing a little bit better than I thought it would do, 
Um, both of them, I, I would say, and, and we, although we're imposing some pretty high pressure here, they would be in that range of, uh, of probably uh, not full control, but more of suppression. Um, so if you do have a, um, an issue with, with either of these on your farm, I think the, you know, one of these herbicides would be good. I might be inclined to go with Simplicity until we collect more data on Everest. Um, but bump those seed rates up to at least 450 and avoid the shorter cultivars. Go to something a little bit taller like this plot here is CDC Buteo. You can see the difference. Um, and so that, that really enhances your, your crop competitiveness. Yes? Well, it depends on the year it, it would, and, and what kind of uh, biotic and abiotic stresses it's exposed to. But, you know, generally, as you increase your seeding rate, your overall seed mortality increases as well, which is okay. We kind of want that. You sort of get rid of the, uh, the weaklings, to, so to speak. But you would be in the neighborhood of about 340 to 350 uh, plants if, if everything went right. If everything went wrong, you might be between 200 to 250, uh, and that's why we like at least a 450 range. Square meter? Yeah. How many, how, what would that be, uh, square foot? You just divide by 10, so it'd be, you know, ideally we want to be set up in spring with winter wheat to have between 20 and 25 plants per square foot. So the question is, what do I have to seed in, spr in fall to guarantee that I'm going to be there? And definitely below 450, if you drop to say 300, uh, I ran a study where three of the site years were below 20 plants per square foot at that rate, which to me is unacceptable because we had actually pretty good overwintering conditions. So if things were tougher in terms of winter kill pressure, or you were on a pea stubble or something that didn't have as good a snow trap potential as say a tall cereal stubble or a, or a canola stubble, you know, you're sort of, you know, setting yourself up for for, I would say, unreasonable risk when you could have mitigated that with just a higher seeding rate. Yes? I had a couple questions. Sure. The first one is, I, I for life of me cannot tell that stuff apart when it's at like two to three leaf stage. Like, is, is there, even, even, even to tell if it's fox tail barley sheep, it's, it's, it's all pretty well the same. Like, once, once it gets about five leaf stage, um, downy brome starts to get a little wider leaves and a little bit more purpling on it, but. Yeah. I think that anthocyanin coloration would be, would be a big one. And it is tough. Like, I mean, it, when we're doing our, our ratings, I mean, the, even Bill Hammond, who's done this for a thousand years, was saying, you know, I have to wait until this stuff pops and heads out for us to get a clearer sense of, okay. of what the pressure was. <laughs> You're not. The, the other question Maybe is, I'm just dumber than you thought and can't answer the question. Um, the, the other thing is, is like, I've been told, uh, with simplicity that uh, um, you get a little bit of antagonization of the 240 on down the road, which is kind of why I, I want to know to figure out a way to tell them apart. Because you know, like if you're mixing some thumper or 240 or something in there, that I, I've seen like three, four leaf downy brome and did not touch it at all, where most of the time it works quite well. But that's kind of that six ounce 240 with it. So what if you did your, I mean, I don't know how, how logistical this is, but what if you did fall 240? Because that, that's one thing we did a lot of work on uh, was, was fall 2,4-D. And, and the thing is, it's got to be just 2,4-D. Any of the, you know, MCPA or anything like that, you don't want to do that in the fall. But just a straight 2,4-D, um, we tried and tried and tried to kill our winter wheat with it. We did everything wrong in the fall just to make sure that, you know, we didn't want to be out there recommending something that was unsafe. Because there were anecdotal reports prior to that study, well, you know, it's, it's a dangerous thing to do or, you know, you're going to get um, head trapping in the spring or stuff like that and, and, and other phenoxy injury type uh, symptoms. But we've done it over and over again. The fall 2,4-D is actually, in fact, a lot of the times just putting fall 2,4-D, unless you've got a severe problem like this, is good enough for winter wheat because it's such a good competitor with weeds, particularly the spring annuals. Why I'm excited about anything fall apple. By the time I get a phone call to come look at this fun stuff growing in my winter wheat, is that downy grow like this fall? Yeah. And it's guys are just too busy doing spring work. Yeah, I agree. Hmm? Separate application this thing. 
Well, as long as you're still within the acceptable window of plant growth stage, weed growth stage, um, you know, that might work. To tell the two, the Japanese and downy broom apart, how, uh, we haven't, we've only got downy broom. If you dig up the seed, the plant and the seed, could you tell there uh, which is which? Uh, yeah, they were quite there? different seeds. Yeah, they are. They were. Broadcast them. You could. It, you'd have to be delicate. But um, I believe the Japanese seed was a, a lot smaller, so it's it's pretty delicate. It's it's not it's not like you. That's what I do with. Uh, I do. That, that's my way of identifying wild oats sometimes too. You know, yeah, if you have a look at it, that could be the case. I mean, uh, definitely, it's a shorter, more compact head. Um, so. In the interest of time, I'm going to move along because the one other thing that we sort of noticed here, um, and, and I'm sure you guys have noticed as well, is that we've had excellent conditions the last couple of years for striped breast. And part of this study as well is we're looking at the eff efficacy of fall foliar fungicides, um, which don't appear to be having much of an effect in terms of management. But what we did have here is we've had some nice striped breast pressure and the reason I say nice is because it's a good opportunity to add an additional discussion point point. Um, and so I asked uh, Denny Gadet, our, our, our plant pathologist and expert on striped breast to come and and give a talk about it because we we were sort of noticing a, an interaction between the different herbicides and the amount of striped breast load and it could have been just where we had the nice say a spring applied simplicity or Everest and a, and a better canopy architecture as a result of, of that, that perhaps that was a better host and, and there was greater disease load. But it sort of has diminished as the disease has progressed. But in any case, uh, Denny has agreed to come and give a, 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 an overview on stripe rust uh, to end the session uh, today. So Denny, come on over here because you have to wear this thing. As Brian mentioned, stripe rust is, is, is we're, we're considering an, an epidemic year on, on winter wheat this year. Uh, there's a couple reasons for that, for which I'll go into a, a little bit later on. Stripe rust causes this, uh, this yellow, orangish uh, pustules on the leaves, and these pustules are, are, are just loaded with spores, and, and this field is heavily infested with, uh, with stripe rust. Now, uh, the reason striped rust is so damaging is not only are, are, are is the, the fungus stealing a lot of resources away from the, uh, the plant because it's, all, it's on all the leaves, but also because it, uh, it causes an eruption of the, 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 the uh, epidermal layer of the, the leaf and the, that uh, leads to a uh, loss of water. And so you'll notice that frequently after a, a hot spell, during an epidemic, all your leaves will just shrivel up because they're losing water, okay? So there's, it's kind of a double whammy, whereas a, a, a leaf spot like tan spot or septoria uh, doesn't necessarily cause that. You'll have infected, non-infected areas, and the infect, non-infected areas will stay green. But uh, on a stripe rust infected uh, plant, uh, the entire leaf will shrivel up and you lose it. The, the entire leaf. So that's why striped rust can be so damaging. Now, about uh, uh, when I started here at the research station about 30 years ago, uh, striped rust wasn't a real problem. And the, uh, because what was happening is striped rust comes in, it usually overwinters in the Pacific Northwestern United States, Idaho, Washington, and it blows in uh, on the prevailing winds through the growing season. And usually by the time it gets to southern Alberta, it, it, it's, it's late in the season, it, it, uh, it, it comes in late, and for that reason, we only saw it on irrigated softwood weeds uh, that were susceptible. And uh, so uh, the, the softwood wheat breeder would, would, of course, include that in his breeding programs. But the other, the other series <laughs> weren't interested in it because it, it, it would generally come in too late. But what has been happening, we've had an epidemic in 2006 and another epidemic in 2011. And what is happening is rather than overwintering in the Pacific Northwest, it's actually overwintering in southern Alberta. And there's, uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, we think that, well, we think that climate change is, is really a, a, an issue here. And in the sense that, uh, on a, on a normal winter wheat uh, field that's infected in the fall because this inoculum will go 
move back to the winter wheat in the fall, uh, those seedlings, uh, normally through the winter the low temperatures kill off the fungus and it just won't survive. But in a mild winter, or as we saw last year, last, year, uh, last winter wasn't particularly a mild winter, but um, what happened is we had more snow than normal. And in the southern part of the uh, province, uh, a lot of uh, winter wheat was covered with a fairly deep layer of snow. And under those conditions, that snow insulates the uh, winter wheat and also insulates the fungus. So you, uh, we got, uh, this year, we got overwintering of, the, uh, of the, 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 the fungus in the plant. And then in the spring, of course, what that, hap what, what that brings on is an earlier infection of the of of the cycle earlier start of the, the infection cycle, and of course, uh, as your spring wheats are coming along, those susceptible spring wheats will also become infected. Okay, so that's that that's the situation that we had this year, and in a previous epidemic year in 2006. Uh, the other problem with this particular fungus is, is it's a highly variable fungus. It's a, it's, it's, it's a fungus we call it uh, uh, that's on the move. Its genetics are such that it, it, it's, it can change its genetics very rapidly. And this is, a, this is a real, real concern. In fact, we in North America, the number one disease in Syria, um, on wheat now is considered stripe rust. Uh, two, two, uh, ten years ago, this fungus, normally stripe rust, we only see it in the inner mountain areas from, uh, from Mexico to uh, southern Alberta. And so uh, Colorado, uh, of course the Pacific Northwest. Why? Because it likes cool temperatures. It's cool infection temperatures, cool moist uh, conditions promote uh, a, a development, of, an infection and development of the fungus. What happened in 2000, a year 1999, 2000, was a new race that came along that developed high temperature tolerance. So this fungus not only moved from uh, the uh, inner mountain areas, but it moved east of the Mississippi. All those uh, wheat growing areas uh, in, uh, in, the, in the east of the Mississippi, as well as uh, west of the Mississippi, were all susceptible to uh, to stripe rust, and they cost it costs them zillions of dollars of losses down there, and uh, so it's one. It's a fungus that's on the move, and we re we refer to this as a, an emerging plant disease uh, because it has the potential of really causing us serial problems in the future. So what can we do about it? Excuse me. Yes, is, sir. Is this the same type of rust that they're talking about in their soybean fields? No, no. As a matter of fact, and that's a good point, uh, what, what does this rust affect? A rust, this stripe rust, only goes to wheat, okay? Now there's a variant of it that goes to barley. And in, uh, out in central Alberta, uh, over the last uh, couple of years, they've been seeing an increase of a stripe rust on barley. But that biotype that affects barley doesn't go to wheat. And the one that affects wheat doesn't go to barley. So, and obviously if it's on soybeans or there's your rust, you see sometimes rust on your roses, the, these diseases don't go to any other species. They're very specific for that species. Good question though. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, and, and these are, that's a, the really good question. I was just, uh, uh, I'll, ex I'll explain the question as I go on. But obviously, in any disease, the earlier that attacks the plant, of course, the more damage it's going to do. And uh, Brian alluded to this in, in, in his sort of uh, uh, discussion of the flag leaf and the flag minus one leaf, okay? So, so and this is why it's particularly damaging because it actually started in, as, at the seedling stage. And those seedling leaves can, uh, can, uh, can, can, can reduce some yield. But the, as, he, as Brian mentioned, it's really the, the flag leaf and the, the flag minus one leaf. We call that the penultimate leaf that is where the, 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 the yield comes in to the head. But 
Before that, if it's very severe, it won't tiller as much, and, and it won't, uh, and, and it won't uh, produce as much uh, green foliar growth. So uh, uh, you can have that effect at an earlier stage, but really, right now, we're going to see the effect on, on yield in this field because your flag leaves are, are, are mostly infested, okay? So uh, uh, when we refer to a, a control measure like uh, um, fungicides, which of course are, are important and an important means of control, if you want to apply a fungicide, you have to make that decision. Whether or not, A, there's enough stripe rust in your field, so you should be getting out and looking for symptoms, okay? Looking for the, the pustules on the leaves. And you can see them on the lower leaves as well as the upper leaves, okay? Now, if they're just on the lower leaves, and, and right now, of course, what do we got? Hot, hot, dry. Not good for stripe rust. Now, uh, this, this, this epidemic might, uh, might, might end right here, and it might not move to spring wheats at all, okay? Just because it's, the conditions are, are, are not perfect for uh, the development of the fungus. But so these are, uh, I guess the, the most important take home message is, 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 is the producers should be out in their fields. They should be monitoring what disease uh, that, that's occurring in their fields. And then they have to start making uh, management decisions on when to spray, when to apply a control measure. And uh, if, if it means protecting uh, your, the leaves, uh, the, the, especially those last two leaves, then yes, I would think that you could get, you get a, a yield advantage for spraying. Uh, a heavily infested field like this could go any, pardon me, anywhere from 15 to 40 percent yield loss. Can you only spray it this once? Uh, this hasn't been sprayed, I don't believe so. Oh. So no. you sprayed it once, like two weeks ago, and we're 60 percent had it now. I can see the fungicide holding the leaves. Yeah. Now, how much potential yield loss is still there after that? Once my fungicide is well, your, your fungicide is, is mostly a systemic fungicide, so you're going to get some post-spray uh, post protection of the new leaves. But eventually, uh, particularly the earlier you apply it, eventually that, that protection is going to run out on you, and you might require a second spray. Yes, sir? Is there any particular fungicide that does a better job on rust than others? You know, uh, most of those, uh, those, um, those fungicides are, are pretty good. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say one, but you have to make sure it's not a, a, a contact um, protective fungicides. It has to be a systemic. And most of the ones that you would encounter, uh, like Tilt and some of the other ones, uh, are, are all, uh, are all uh, systemic. Yes, sir? This stuff's running a, like its whole sexual cycle, so like it basically it can have rust blowing off your wheat fields into your spring wheat. You betcha, you betcha, and uh, we've seen uh, we've had several reports uh, of Durham uh, uh, Durham under irrigation coming down with it, and a lot of it. So, uh, and which is kind of scary because Durham's is supposed to be resistant, and I'll I'll discuss that uh, shortly. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Are, if they've got an early crop and they're just starting to see signs of disease, are they better off to spray then or wait a couple weeks, say, till when it gets the crops bigger and the disease is more intense and then spray and stop it, like protecting that plant? Or are they better off to protect it early, stop it where it's at, and then they might have to go in again? Sure, right? You know, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And uh, the studies have been done uh, on this, and uh, what they're finding is if, if you have to spray, and this is all in average years, and there's no, no such thing as an average year, but the, you, the maximum yield benefit you'll get is by spraying it uh, at uh, flowering. Yeah. Uh, because uh, if you play a little bit uh, too early, you don't get it. And of course, a lot of fungicides, you've got to watch the label, eh? because uh, you, they have certain restrictions on when you can spray, and you can't spray too late, you know. 
Uh, some, some people are looking at uh, maybe a, a spray for a fusarium head blight. Uh, you know, the same type of uh, try to get two birds with one stone. And, and if you can spray around the flowering stage, I think that that would give you the best, uh, the, probably the most economical and broadest control for, for several uh, diseases. Yes. Flowering. Yes. So, you know, I, it was a tough call, but will it benefit the crop anymore to go in there and spray? You know. The, the crop was covered. I left that field orange. Yes. And that's, that's a danger. Of course, uh, uh, back to what Brian had mentioned about, you know, uh, how much of the, the flag leaf and how, how much of the penultimate. I wouldn't spray this field now because uh, most of it's gone. It's too late. It's too late. No, no, absolutely not. Yeah, the yield potential is set now. Yeah, yeah. Because so it's mostly it's mostly into grain fill and it's mostly water that uh, that it's moving now. Unless you're spraying for fusarium. Yeah, of, of course. There, there, there's another another component there. Now, some of the uh, I, I was just going to get back to some of the uh, the, the the crops. Uh, of course, uh, winter wheats. We, uh, the, most of the, the varieties were, were super susceptible and are super susceptible. Uh, the one variety, Radiant, was uh, immune up to a couple of years ago. Now, uh, the, because I, as I mentioned, the fungus has changed genetically, uh, the new races now can, 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 can uh, give you a, a, a susceptible reaction on, on Radiant. That's a huge shift and it's a huge fear uh, for me and, and some of the people that work on it because uh, that means uh, there are no uh, winter wheats now that, 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 that are, are, suscept are resistant to this disease. Uh, but the winter wheat breeder is acutely aware of it and he's got uh, advanced lines in his breeding program. So we're anticipating uh, uh, some varieties in the and not too distant future that will be resistant. So it's something that can ta can ta takes a lot of uh, a breeding and a breeding effort with these type of disease. Number two, the spring wheats. Some of the, the spring wheats, as I mentioned, uh, derms are resistant. Uh, triticale resistant, not a problem. I wouldn't even spray those. Some of the spring wheats, like uh, our best spring wheats, like Lillian and, and Harvest, and uh, uh, the, uh, the fellow at, uh, at the, at, in the Stetler at the disease uh, disease clinic there, there you phone in and uh, you get your call center. Uh, he's got a list of varieties that are resistant, spring wheat varieties. If I was seeding a spring wheat variety, I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be spraying that. Okay, you might see some as, as a juvenile stage, seedling stage, you might see some spores on it, but as an adult stage, they've got this kind of interesting type of resistance we call that adult plant resistance. And the adult plants are very are quite resistant to this disease, so uh, those varieties I wouldn't be spraying. But having said that, varieties like berry and superb, very susceptible. Uh, so you want to be you want to keep an eye out for uh, if you've got those those varieties, uh, uh, you know, monitor your fields. And then you've got to, to, uh, to uh, consider the management options that you have available to you when you make that decision. And those are all the varieties. What's that? Those are all the varieties, like the berries and those ones. Yeah, berries are all, they're so superb, but uh, certainly the, uh, the newer ones, as I say, Harvest, uh, uh, Lillian, these are very popular varieties in southern Alberta. They're good. How about CDC Abound? CDC abound. I don't have the, the information on that, and uh, I can provide you with that information. I have the list in my office. There's, a lot, there's such a, a, a lot of them, but I would think that abound could be resistant as well, just from what I remember, but I, I, I'm not sure. So what you're saying is, like, y'all and guys have gotten excited about seeing this show from some spring wheat, like, at the six week stage, is that it's probably not hurting anything? It's... Could you repeat the question? Sorry. So, like, like I've had some guys calling me that have said they've been seeing a little bit show up in like some six week, you know, five six week winter. Right. Like it, it's really not hurting anything in there, 
keep an eye on uh, uh, as it goes out and check your variety too because as I say if it's got this resistance it's actually a, a really neat type of resistance it provides resistance to both leaf rust and stem rust as well so it's, it's, it's the same gene and it's, it's so uh, the reason why we have these these resistant varieties as a matter of fact is because it it's the same resistance for leaf rust and stem rust and so they breed those so that, that resistance is required in the east and this particular gene is really good for controlling stripe rust too. So keep it. No, leaf spots, uh, tan spot, no, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, sorry, it's a, it's, it's a good question though. So um, I do have some handouts here. For those who are interested, you can come and see me. Uh, we, are, we are breeding, uh, obviously, as I say, this is an emerging disease. So uh, the breeders are really aware of the, the, the potential for the damage caused by this fungus. So the breeding programs are actively developing resistance. And uh, I would say in the future, uh, not too distant future, we will, uh, we will have a handle, hopefully, on stripe rust. But what kills the fungus? How cold is it after? Well, usually, of course, you want those uh, at least uh, maybe a week of minus 10. So that, that's easy around here uh, during the winter time, uh, no problem. But as I say, under, under, a, under a nice uh, bank of snow, that temperature won't drop more than minus three, so minus four. I made a comment earlier, canola stubber versus barley. What could probably happen there? We probably had more protection on the canola stubber for the rust fungus to stay alive. And maybe even stress more on the canola stubber because the canola had taken more nutrient moisture out of the ground. Because the winter we'd had more rust in the canola. I think these two points would probably explain that. Yeah, and that, that, that could be a reasonable explanation. And, and because those studies really haven't been done, you know, because it's a fairly new disease and people really, those are the studies that we actually need to do to, to identify what rotations will, will lead to the survival of the fungus or not, you know. There was more snow in the canola Yeah, and that would, make it, that would make sense. That would make sense. Some yeah. 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 So it, it could it could be that, but remember that 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 uh, uh, stripe rust is blowing in from around, eh? Mm -hmm. So uh, once it's here, then it doesn't matter. The stubble effect wouldn't make any difference. Yeah. It's it's going to move in from any infested fields, and these these. Uh, there's so many spores. There's zillions of spores in, in just this field. So uh, you get a you know a couple a couple of uh, sections of it, and it can create one heck of a spore shower that could end up in drum hell or, and raining down there, just depending on on the winds. So it's uh, it's, it's 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 amazing. The other thing is is even under, under fairly dry conditions, if you see uh, uh, early morning dew. Where you know you're walking through your fields and you're getting your your feet your your boots wet, that's that's excellent conditions for uh, stripe rust infection. Yep. Any more questions? Oh, well, thanks a lot for your attention. And as I say, I do have some uh, some handouts for anybody who's interested. Raven as a company was started in 1958 um, building high pressure weather balloons and has evolved as a company into uh, precision agricultural spraying equipment. Um, back in 1978 they came out with one of the first ground speed compensated automatic rate control systems. So back in 78 the term precision agriculture basically was a, a rate controller. So since 78 to today, um, it's grown into mean much more than just a rate controller. Um, as of today, we're in command on, on I'm gonna say roughly 70% of all self-propelled sprayers has some Raven componentry in it, which I would consider five of the uh, um, most crucial pieces of equipment on the sprayer, um, one being 
brake control obviously, the second being a steering system, third system being automatic section shutdown, of course your GPS system, your uh, and your auto boom system for boom leveling. So the concept behind a, an automatic ground speed compensated brake controller has not changed from that first SCS 440 or 400 controller to today what you see in these cabs. The, the concept, sorry, concept is still the same. What it's based on is a, is a flow based system. So flow meter, ground speed sensor of some type, boom widths, uh, equal application rate. It basically boils down to as simple as that. So obviously as the vehicle speeds up and slows down, the volume of, of liquid is increased or decreased and being controlled either by an inline control valve or in a lot of cases on the newer machines, a PWM control valve or pulse width modulation where the pump itself is your, your rate control device or your inline control valve. So the, uh, the, the next evolution of rate control or product control now would be what we call a direct chemical injection systems that you put a positive displacement dual piston pump on board with a 24 US gallon tank and inject pure chemical into the line for spot spraying or you can just put in this case 1200 gallons of pure water in your tank and inject pure chemical into it. So the savings there is on a year like this year where 100 acres maybe isn't necessarily 100 acres anymore because there's sloughs out there that have not been there in the past, you really don't know how much to mix in your tank. So again, if you just put pure water in your tank and inject chemical into the line, it really doesn't matter if you've mixed too much to move on to the next field. So that coupled with uh, your steering system and your rate controller saves you a lot of time and effort and money. So injection isn't new. It's been out for a number of years since about 96. Um, so it's not a new concept, but it's just with the, the evolution of, of precision spraying, it's really becoming a popular item now. So second system that's saving growers a lot of time and effort, uh, again, is the GPS steering systems. All of ours are hydraulic machine specific. It's not a one size fit all kit. So for this particular machine here, you would order up the, the right kit for it. The hoses are correct. Everything is for this machine. So the difference uh, with any steering system would be on the accuracy of it. So then we have a lot of different choices of GPS signal, WAS being good enough for a lot of guys and has been for a number of years, 8 to 12 inch accuracy, but now with the inception of uh, Omnistar signal and or our slingshot RTK signal, we can get down to sub inch accuracy. So the next piece of the puzzle on an automatic ground speed compensated system would be automatic section shutdown. Again, saving more chemical, making better use of the chemical and not over applying. So, with that equipment on board, you are now going longer and harder with the same amount of chemical, but you're putting it where it needs to be and not overlapping. So, and the last system that we offer is called our Auto Glide, which is our automatic boom sensor or boom height control system. Again, um, certain conditions, certain spray pressures, uh, whatever tips you're using. That boom has to be steady to get the best coverage. So with the ultrasonic sensors that are mounted on the boom, you just simply put in your target height of whatever height you want to spray across the ground or across the top of the canopy, and the system will automatically keep your booms level. So that roughly in a nutshell is, is where precision agricultural in a sprayer goes. The same concept holds true for a uh, liquid application, like liquid fertilizer and hydrous ammonia application. There's a lot of duplicate systems um, for allowing this, the GPS to shut different styles of equipment down. Um, again, saving hopefully time and effort, fuel, wear and tear on your machine. So.
Any questions on any of the, the systems so far? When you have the automatic shut off for spraying, right? For no, the section. For section. Are they working on that for seeding? Yes. Yeah. Right now we're uh, we're controlling the seed hawk. Um, yeah. Sectional control is is made by oh, Raven okay. for Seed Hawk. Yes. So, are you working on other outfits? We have done some uh, what we call beta testing in Saskatchewan for the last two years, as well as in Australia, on other types of air seeders. I can't go into too much detail, but they're going to come out with what we call either a universal kit, or it'll be at the OEM level, like uh, like Seed Hawk is today. So multiple product um, up to five products with the viper pro so a three bin air seeder plus either liquid or anhydrous or a combination of both up to five products variable rate simultaneously so, with sectional control so. any other questions yes sir We're, we're presently not working on any Green Seeker type of, of system, no. Green Seeker is out there and they, they've done a pretty good job with that market, so. Like an electronic sensor or something like that that sees green, so. Our injection systems that we sell to the railway companies to do railway spraying use Green Seeker in conjunction with our direct chemical injection system, so. See something green, it turns the pump on and gives it a little drink, so. So we're at a day and age now where signal reliability in terms of GPS and precision agriculture is coming to question a lot. A lot of people are still using WAS, are still very comfortable with that system. A lot of people need to jump to Omnistar, and then of course the be all end all is RTK. Um, there is traditional RTK, and there's almost a new school version of RTK. Traditional RTK is one tower that covered an eight mile radius, and basically you had to be within line of sight of that tower to keep your sub inch RTK or the ability access. What there is now is there's something called RTK VRS, which is a virtual reference station, and I'll turn things over to Ed now and he'll discuss Raven's version of the virtual reference station. Thanks, Brent. So I've got just a little actual uh, base station is what we call it here. Um, this new way of, of delivering RTK corrections um, pretty much set the whole RTK industry on its rear end here about two years ago. This base station is most times deployed at, a, at an implement dealer's uh, location. Um, simply plugged into the wall and is plugged into the internet and then this antenna is just ran up on a roof. We don't have to have it ran on a grain leg anymore or on the top of the elevator or anything like that. It uh, runs off the existing cell phone towers is, is basically how it works. So you need in the cab of your tractor now instead of just a WAS only receiver which probably most everybody here started with years ago. Um, it runs off of a, a dual frequency antenna. So that's the first thing when you step up from the WAS world and step into the RTK world, chances are you're gonna have to upgrade your existing GPS antenna to accept either an Omnistar signal or an RTK signal. A WAS only system just, it won't collect the uh, the, the data that is being sent or the corrections that are being output. Um, so this base station here conservatively covers about a 30 mile radius. Um, and I say conservatively, um, it's not a line of sight issue. Uh, it's uh, cell phone coverage is the, the one thing that may be the limiting factor. We work on the data side of the cell phone signal, not on the voice side. So the biggest thing I get asked every day is, you know, well, I've got this one part of my farm or my field where my cell phone, I can't send or receive a call. Well, we don't work on that side of the cell phone. We're working on the data side or the texting side of your cell phone, if you will, for you guys that are texters. I'm not much of one, but 
Um, so the, that side of the cell signal is, is a lot stronger. So we're able to pick up the signal at greater distances um, using the cell phone system. So basically the, uh, the system is backed up at the dealership with a five hour um, battery power. So if the, the dealership's power happened to go out and he's got 60 guys out seeding that same day, it will automatically just kick over to the battery backup four or five hours. Then our office in Sioux Falls gets a hold of the dealer because we see it right away that there's been a power change and somebody from the dealership is alerted. Same thing holds true with the internet side. If his internet goes down, there's a wireless modem built in here to again automatically just flip on to still be collecting the, the RTK corrections and sending them out to you guys in the field. So again, the dealership is notified right away if there has been a problem or has been an issue at the dealership. So. From the equipment that would be installed in your cab to collect this wireless RTK correction to your dual frequency new antennas or not new but maybe new to some of you is a, a wireless modem. That's what this little box here is. So that gets installed into the cab, gets plugged into your antenna and then there's two tiny little wireless antennas that are mounted on the roof of your vehicle. So that's, that's what's bringing the, the RTK corrections via the internet into the cab of your tractor. So you've gone from roughly 12 inches down to sub-inch with a few other pieces of equipment mounted in the cab of your tractor. But that's only one part of, of what slingshot brought to the table as far as precision agriculture, precision spraying, precision planting, whatever term you want to use. Uh, the whole slingshot concept is, has been, we've been looking for it for a number of years. Even back about 12 years ago on the old Viper 2s, there was still an ethernet port on the back of the, the Viper 2 console. We just didn't have the, the equipment to make it work at that time. So Slingshot actually is, is nothing new. Many of you may have heard of it. It's an Alberta made product developed in Red Deer, Alberta by a company who used to be called Ranchview RTK. Well, Raven bought that company out and as of right now it is, it is worldwide. Gets in Australia, Germany, Brazil, Canada, obviously, you name it. It's, it's worldwide doing for the world farmers exactly what it's going to be doing for, for you here. So, again, we're being Albertan, I guess, and a little, little proud of that fact. I guess it's not a, an American thought up product. So. Saying that, um, the other thing that it, it does bring to the table, many of you are running maybe Raven controllers. Trimble controllers, John Deere controllers. You're building maps each and every day in the field. Now what do you do with those maps? Do you just sit there and be erased or carried on to the next year? There's not really a, a great deal of, of farmers out there that are making use of what they're creating every day. The problem had been to get the information from the cab and to the office and then in the office, what do you do with it then? So, With agronomists coming out and some of these precision farming type companies that are building prescription maps now, that industry is really growing or taking off. So each and every time you would close a job now on our Raven Viper or ePro, your job is automatically sent via the, the internet wirelessly to your Slingshot account that you've set up. Uh, on our servers. So from there, I mean, you can send it directly to your agronomist, again, saving him a lot of time and effort having to come out to your farm, take the information, and then take it back to his office, build a map, and bring it back to you. There's a lot of, a lot of time and effort and driving involved, if you will. So Slingshot gives you the ability now to save and store all your maps relatively painlessly. As soon as you hit end job, that map is automatically sent away. So, so is that any point or by definition telematics? Or what is that? Telematics, I believe, is different. 
that I'm not 100% sure. You know, right? I've heard the term telematics before, but. No, it's just running a, it's running a wireless internet into your controller. Yes. Yeah, and you know, so. so yeah. 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 Because the thing also with, with the field hub itself, it's not strictly an internet connection only for your monitor that is sending maps. What it does, it also comes with a data plan, similar to what you use on your cell phone or what you use at home. So yeah. not only can you be, you know, farming on your auto steer and stuff like that, but guys are also checking their emails, they're, you know, they're checking prices, you know, they're watching YouTube videos. You know, there's different, so many different things that you can do now with a virtual reference station you can just to the internet in a cab of a tractor. It's basically you're farming and then you have your office with you. Okay. Can you take that system and if I threw a map on there? And they could download it right to the controller, and then all of a sudden I can have variable rate working with them? Right yes, the yep. From your agronomist or whoever built your prescription map, he could email it right to the console in your cab. And you open that particular job up, and based on the map, it's variable rating. So, so does it send it in the in in shape file format? I believe it's an ArcView shape file format, yeah. yeah. I always thought those files were pretty darn big, because whenever I get them from the drawers, I'm working with that we're Here in, in the province of Alberta, it's a little different here. Um, now we're on HSPA as far as a, an internet speed goes. Um, Saskatchewan and, and Manitoba, I believe, are still on um, CDMA, so it's, it's faster. It's a 4G network that we're you capable of. Yep. When you close a job, it, it saves it as a file here of whatever you name that job and will automatically send it away as soon as you hit close. Well, I was just thinking about the size of the file. It must take a long time to send it. Okay. No, time wise. I'm not that terrible, but I mean, I had four guys with it. It was just through the internet sticks this year. I mean, we could do just through it on this thing. What else it, it brings to the, the Raven controllers that is out there? Um, this, this console being what's called the Viper Pro, which is in I'm going to say most self-propelled sprayers that we supply equipment to at an OEM level um, is there's those five operating systems I talked about outside. Well, these become dangerous tools. And if you happen to uh, accidentally wipe out a, a meter cal number or some calibration value and you weren't sure what you did, you would be phoning the local dealer and he would have to start his service truck up and drive out there and find your problem first of all most times hopefully it's a simple calibration error with the slingshot modem in the cab now it offers the dealer it offers us at Raven or wherever you want it to remotely connect to your Viper or Invisio Pro in the cab so at least it gives the dealer a fighting chance to diagnose the problem before he drives, say, all the way out to your farm, realizes he needs a, a flow meter or he needs a sensor of some type, he can, he can view from his office computer or his service desk exactly what's going on in your cab or your tractor while you're spraying. He can see it on his desk. So that's what we call remote support. So that really, again, took this industry to the next level of where it needed to be or where it was going in the precision ag world. So you're not sitting out in a cab of your tractor for two hours, maybe scratching your head, wondering what number I've deleted by accident or, or what, what the problem is. So it's, a, it's a nice feature. Um, as far as the RTK goes, I'm going to just back up here a little bit because I stepped over this rather important comment. I missed it totally yesterday. The RTK um, signal that we're providing is not only just for Raven receivers, I mean, it's for Trimble, it's for Topcon, it's for uh, Outbacks, uh, Paradigm Systems. So it's, it's a universal solution to an RTK. You don't necessarily just need to have a, a Raven receiver in the cab to collect this, because we've had to become somewhat experts on our competitors' equipment so we can connect to it. So if you're uh, a brand A fan or a brand X fan or a brand Y fan, you can still take part of the RTK signal. The remote support 
won't be there for some of the other breeds, but the slingshot account will still be there for you. Um, so there's definitely some advantages on the Raven side of things, having everything Raven, but we do play well with the competition as well, as far as on a GPS signal level. So. Am I missing anything, Brent? Uh, one more quick thing to touch on too with this as well. It also allows location technology. So say if you're a producer and you have a large fleet, you know, different tractors going to different fields, different sprays going to different fields, you'd be able to pull up on a website and see exactly where your vehicles are at all times and which ones are running and which ones aren't running. So, you know, if little Timmy's sleeping in the cab, you'd be able to know in a hurry where he's at and why he is. Yeah. So just another little thing that comes with it as well. How does we have to set up on our website to do that. You, it would be through it would be through the, the slingshot the website, I guess, and maybe yeah. the Your your slingshot account yeah. would have uh, fleet maintenance on it, if you will, or, or fleet identification. So based on the Google map, you would see where each one of your and could you motives. See it? Would it be real time? Yes. Yeah. Whatever you've done in the field, yeah. yes. If you've, if it, it goes down and is, is stored in our servers securely under your password, if you will. Right. And then what you do with it after that is totally up to you. Okay. If you wanted to email that map to your agronomist or to some company who's building you a prescription map, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. Whenever you sign up for the slingshot, you get a modem, you're automatically signed up for a slingshot account. Is there a manual license fee? At the dealership level, yes. Um, typically, uh, subscription <coughs> fee is about $1,500 a year to collect just the RTK side of it. The rest is free. The slingshot is all paid for basically up front. Yeah, yeah. And that, the cell phone charge varies depending on what you use it for. If you're using primarily strictly for guidance purposes and RTK purposes, maybe you know a month, a month, very small data plan. But as I said earlier, if you're checking emails and things like that, it can be like normal internet stick. So. That's good. No more questions? Everybody's tired for a couple? Right, if you guys could thank me for having that come out here.